All right. So uh, it is my pleasure to open the 10th installment of the Nuremberg Lectures in Geometric Analysis. These uh, lectures were instituted in 2014 in honor of the great Canadian-born mathematician, uh, Louis Nuremberg, who went to uh, Barambing High School on the plateau here in Montreal and obtained his BSc in mathematics and physics uh, from McGill University, also here in Montreal in 1945, before going on to graduate with a PhD from NYU in 1949 and doing uh, uh, groundbreaking work in uh, areas of geometric analysis and uh, PD in numerous prestigious awards, including the Abel Prize. Uh, the Nuremberg Lectures are a distinguished lecture series devoted to recent breakthroughs in areas related to geometric analysis. This year's topic is mathematical billiards with talks by uh, professors uh, Misha Belti and uh, Sergei Tabashnikov. Today's speaker is Mikhail M Misha Bialy, a professor at Tel Aviv University. He uh, received his PhD from the Weizmann Institute of Science under the <coughs> supervision of uh, Yosef Yomdin in 1991. Uh, prior to that, he has worked in Yakov Sinai Group in Moscow. Professor Belly is an internationally renowned expert in billiard dynamics, completely integrable systems, Hamiltonian mechanics, and related areas of symplectic topology. His work includes a celebrated result from the 1990s on billiards without conjugate points, collaboration with Leonid Polterovich on geodesics and Hopper's geometry, and a recent breakthrough paper with Andrei Mironov, the Birkhoff Ritsky conjecture. Uh, he will uh, deliver uh, two lectures, one today and one on Wednesday. His uh, lecture, lecture today is uh, called Integral Billiards and Rigidity One. Misha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, it's a great honor for me to, uh, to take part in this uh, remarkable uh, geometric analysis lectures. Uh, uh, Louis Nuremberg, in fact, visited several times uh, Israel, and he was a really remarkable person, uh, very friendly, and it was really a pleasure to uh, talk to him. So uh, I shall motive. So you see, I, I tried uh, billiards are quite quite far away from mm -hmm, uh, PDEs, uh, and uh, therefore I try to find the motivation for, <laughs> for for my subject. And here it is. So uh, uh, Nirenberg used to say, "I have made a living of the maximum principle, a particular simple proof." Of, uh, of of the strong maximal principle was given by Ehoff. Uh, uh, Nirenberg was influenced a lot, I think, uh, by this, by his idea, Hoff's ideas, and uh, later on he gave an extension of uh, of the strong maximal principle for parabolic equations, and uh, so uh, motivated by this uh, tradition. I'm going to uh, to discuss another Hopf result, uh, which has uh, applications to uh, billiards. So, in fact, so this is my motivation. You see, so uh, since Nirenberg was uh, interested in Hopf ideas, so we are also somehow looked at this, and and that's the subject of these two lectures, which I'm going to. Uh, to talk about. So, hope rigidity for Riemannian manifold. Let, let me remind you what, what is this. So, uh, you see, it's a theorem of about uh, 93, uh, 1943 uh, uh, on Riemannian Torah with no conjugate points. So, Hopf, uh, if, if you have a geodesic, it's known to be locally minimizing before the first conjugate points. Point, and uh, uh, the uh, if you have a, if you have a geodesic in the uh, in the two dimensions, you you just write down the Jacobi equation. This is uh, second order linear 
equation uh, YWT plus KTYT equals zero, where KT is uh, where KT is the curvature of the metric, and uh, YT is uh, the orthogonal Jacobi field, what is called uh, orthogonal Jacobi field. So now, if you have uh, conjugate points, uh, the definition is the following. If you have a Jacobi field which vanishes, non-trivial Jacobi field which vanishes at two uh, distinct points, these two points are called conjugate points. Hopf proved the following result, that uh, Riemannian torus with no conjugate points is necessarily flat. So uh, in other words, uh, if you have a curve uh, torus, uh, there are always exist uh, there always exists a geodesics, in fact many, uh, such that along these geodesics uh, there are conjugate points. In other words, this geodesics uh, this geodesic is not minimizing after some time uh, if you travel along it some time. So let me uh, outline the idea of his proof because it's uh, really brilliant and very simple. So suppose you have uh, the condition that no conjugate points exist. Then uh, the, his st first step is uh, to construct along uh, every geodesic a positive Jacobi field. That is such a Jacobi field which doesn't vanish at all. So how to do that? So uh, very simple, uh, no conjugate point points condition uh, means that you can solve boundary value problem for this second order uh, Jacobi equation uh, at any two points if you require y to be equal one at point A and y equal zero at point B, then uh, there exists and only one such a Jacobi field sati which satisfies this boundary condition. And now the idea of Hopf was uh, to take this point where it vanishes to infinity. So I, I, I shall show the picture and then I can come back to this slide. So you see, here is the picture. You have two points A and B. You, you find a Jacobi field YT such that it's equal one at A and zero and B. And now what he do, uh, what Hopf does, he takes this B to plus infinity. And what happens that all these Jacobi fields, they are ordered somehow. And then uh, there is a limited uh, limiting solution, which is called J. So here, it, so I come back to my slide. So, uh, uh, so again, non-conjugate points condition uh, uh, allows Hopf to find positive Jacobi field by the following limiting procedure. Uh, consider this boundary value problem and then take this point B to plus infinity, then the, uh, it's quite easy to see that uh, 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 this uh, these functions Y parameterized by B have a, have a limit, have a limit which we call JT, GTA and this this Jacobi field is already everywhere positive. And uh, now uh, after, after Hof constructed this Jacobi field, uh, you can cook a function uh, which is called omega. This function is the ratio of the derivative G prime over J. And now uh, uh, notice that you, you can divide by J because J is positive now. And then uh, it's uh, quite easy to see that this omega uh, satisfies a Riccati equation. Here it is written, omega prime, where prime is the derivative along uh, the geodesic flow, plus omega square plus k equals zero. This is the first step. So first step to construct positive Jacobi field. And then out of this Jacobi field, you can construct this function omega, which satisfies this equation, Riccati equation. And now the second step is a kind of integral geometric step. Here it is. Uh, let's take this Riccati equation. 
and integrate all of the so consider this function as omega as a function on the unit tangent bundle because for every geodesic you can construct such a function and uh, I'm sorry you can construct such a field j and in fact uh, uh, j of course is not uniquely defined but this ratio is uniquely defined and so you have a function on the phase space on the unit tangent bundle satisfying this equation and now let's integrate this equation against uh, Liouville measure which is preserved by the geodesic flow then uh, the derivative of omega prime vanishes because uh, geodesic flow uh, preserves Liouville measure uh, of the unit tangent bundle and so uh, the the conclusion is that uh, integral of omega square plus k must vanish but uh, uh, due to Gauss Bonnet integral of k vanishes and so this means that uh, the only possibility is that omega must be zero identically and so if it is zero identically then we come back to the equation again and we find that k equals zero so this is the proof by Hope and now what what is remarkable why, why I'm talking about this because uh, uh, the idea of uh, of these two lectures which I'm going to to deliver is uh, that this um, method somehow is very fruitful for billiard dynamics uh, more precisely as Igor told uh, told correctly so I proved that uh, uh, some 30 years ago that um, circular billiard can be recovered uh, by this method but uh, what we did with Mironov and this was completely unexpected uh, that somehow elliptical billiard can be also uh, recovered so in some sense Hopf method these two ideas th these ideas uh, 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 which I mentioned in in the Hop in the Riemannian case they are uh, uh, even more rich uh, in in the case of billiard somehow uh, the situation is discrete nevertheless uh, it allows uh, as we shall see so so now let us discuss what what the setting is so uh, uh, what what i'm going to talk about is, is a generalization some generalizations of uh, of what we saw uh, to the twist maps, so-called twist maps of the cylinder and Birgov billiard. So I, I shall give the definitions. So uh, suppose we have gamma, a simple closed C2, remarkably only C2 smoothness is needed, uh, strictly convex curve in the plane. And let's uh, fix counterclockwise orientation on gamma. Uh, the assumption which is uh, all, all, all th throughout these two lectures that the gamma is has strictly positive curvature so uh, uh, strictly positive curvature in the plane okay now uh, I shall denote a uh, bolt the face cylinder of, of the billiard ball map what is this uh, you see, uh, billiard is the following system. You have oriented line which intersects gamma, and then it is reflected to another uh, oriented line. So the phase space of the bill of the billiard is the space of all oriented lines in the plane intersecting gamma. So A here uh, is the cylinder, uh, which is this space is topologically cylinder. And uh, we have a mapping which is called billiard ball map. This map uh, transforms uh, oriented line intersecting gamma to a reflected one. And this is a, uh, uh, we shall see it as a symplectic map, and it is called billiard ball map. So this billiard is called Birgov billiard. So one, uh, this convex shape and reflections, this is called Birgov billiard because Birgov was. Uh, probably the first who studied this. 
Okay, so in the book of Arnold, you can find it's written there that you can think about billiard motion as the limiting case of geodesic motion on the sphere. So if you have a sphere, you uh, shrink it to uh, to a flat uh, shape, and and then uh, you can say it's a limiting case uh, of the motion of the sphere. But in fact, what we shall to, we shall see today that it is in some sense analogous to a geodesic flow on the torus and not on the sphere by by some dynamical features. For example, this hop result, which is uh, true for uh, 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 non-conjugate uh, uh, tori with no conjugate points. So here is the picture of Birgov billiard. Billiard. So you have a, this is our curve gamma. S is a arc length parametrization of gamma. And we have a li oriented line, uh, this oriented line, which enters with angle delta. So you have uh, two, day, two numbers, S and delta. And uh, after this line is reflected to a new line. Uh, at the point gamma s1 and the angle delta 1. So you have a map uh, s delta goes to s1 delta 1. And so uh, this is the billiard ball map in these coordinates. And uh, uh, here we shall denote L. Uh, this is the function of two variables, s and s1. This is the just the length of this horde. And we shall see its generating function. So now what is uh, integrable billiards? Uh, so uh, I'm talking about, again, only on Birgov billiards, so what I described. So there are two cases known. What is What does mean integrable? So I'm asking, if I, in fact, the following question. If, there, uh, if you have a billiard, you may ask, if, if does there exist a function, uh, which is called first integral, such that it is preserved under the dynamics. So in other words, I'm looking for a function f on, on, on the phase cylinder, such that it is invariant under the billiard ball map. T. So there are two cases known. Uh, first is the circle. So in this case, uh, uh, the integral is um, momentum. You see, you have, here is on this picture on the right, you have a line. Uh, uh, oriented line, and you uh, consider momentum of this line with respect to the center of the uh, circle. This is P. So this, uh, you can think about distance or uh, sign distance to this line. And then this P is preserved. After the reflection, you have exactly the same momentum uh, as uh, it was before the reflection. Now, in the case B, there always there also exists a conserved quantity, but in this case, in the case B of ellipse, uh, it's more complicated. You see, here it is a kind of first degree in momenta, and here it is second degree of momenta. What it is, it's just a product of two momenta. So you have a line L, uh, this oriented line, and in in the ellipse you have two foci f1, f2. And then uh, you can measure uh, the momentum of L with respect to F F1 and uh, the momentum of L with respect to F2. This is P1, P2. And then you take a product of these. And it turns out that this product is conserved. So this uh, I learned from Sir Michael Berry. Uh, he he loves to so probably he is not the first uh, person mentioned mentioning this, but uh, I, I learned it from him. So uh, you can explicitly write uh, these p one p two via the momentum p uh, because p one is just p minus c cosine phi, where phi is the this angle. And uh, P2 is P plus C cosine phi. And so the formula for the, uh, for the integral is uh, uh, P square minus uh, some function of phi. Uh, so you see here it's uh, quadratic in uh, momentum.
Okay, so product of two momentums. Right. So uh, famous Birgov conjecture uh, asks if, uh, if there are other integrable billiards uh, uh, in addition to circles and ellipses. And uh, recently there was much progress in, in the direction of this conjecture uh, to answer it affirmatively. Um, so, uh, there, well, I, I will tell, uh, I, I will, I will uh, explain what are the approaches later on. So uh, let me draw the picture. So here is the picture of the face portrait. So what is read, what is drawn here is the uh, annulus. Uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, you can think about these sides as identified. So then you get an annulus, and and here also, and these are two face portraits. These are levels of this function f, which I described above. So in this case, these are just circles. Uh, going around the cylinder, okay, and uh, and in this case you see these are this portrait, this face portrait is much more complicated. Uh, you have here elliptic points; uh, they correspond to uh, short uh, di uh, short diameter, uh, no, not diameter, short periodic uh, orbit uh, inside the ellipse, and you have these points hyperbolic. They correspond to diameters of ellipse, and you have separatrices between them and uh, perestroikas of these curves from uh, non-contractable to uh, these curves which are contractable. Misha, I believe there is a question from John Harnad. Okay. Uh, yes, just very quickly. This looks exactly the same as the phase uh, portrait for a pendulum, is it? Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. So it's elliptic functions. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Thank you. But, but dynamics is different. So there you have continuous time system. Here it's discrete time. So your our mapping now, it's uh, um, discrete mapping. So you if you start somewhere here on the curve, then you... Uh, the, the mapping maps to another point on this curve and so on, right? And the same, ah, no, no, it's T squared, yeah, the, another. Now, if you have here, uh, then uh, you, you need to consider T squared because uh, from here you go here and then uh, back to this curve, okay? So, and so on. So, uh, I mean, yeah, so it's topologically, it's it looks the same and uh, not only topologically probably. Mm -hmm. Is it actually a Poincaré map? T is a Poincaré map, right. So so it's just really the same, but uh, evaluated at certain time intervals. Okay, but, well, I I, I, I don't know. I, I cannot make precise statement, uh, and I, I will not need it, in fact. So, I mean, pendulum is a good idea, but, uh, I mean, topologically it looks the same. Uh, for me, what what will be important that these uh, portraits are different. So, for example, here is a bunch of curves going around, okay, or around the cylinder, and then there is a perestroika, and they, uh, these are contractible inside. Okay, here it is uh, the conjecture. So the conjecture is that the only integrable convex plane billiards are ellipses and uh, recent approaches uh, 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 are related with uh, 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 Glutzuk. He gave uh, he uh, uh, his approach is uh, algebraic in a sense. So you see F, there was F which was first degree in P, then second degree of P and, and so uh, Glutzuk uh, uh, can do polynomial integrals and so on. Uh, Colossian Sorrentina, which consider a kind of local version of Birgov conjecture, meaning uh, uh, trying to understand uh, if there are uh, integrable billiards uh, in the neighborhood of ellipses. Uh, and uh, recently, there is a new billiard player 
uh, young mathematician Ilya Koval from uh, Kaloshan group and uh, he has somehow uh, remarkable contribution. Okay, so now, uh, but I'm going to tell, uh, to push uh, this Hopf idea, uh, Hopf, uh, kind of generalization of Hopf method. And so here are the uh, theorem, uh, which, which I proved many years ago. So suppose uh, there is a face, uh, suppose that the face, uh, the face space A is foliated by rotational invariant curves uh, of the billiard ball man. Then this billiard is circular. So in other words, suppose you have a, uh, a billiard such that its face portrait looks like, uh, topologically, looks like this one. Then it is a circle. So in other words, if you have invariant curves, he, not necessarily straight ones, but non-contractable invariant curves foliating the phase space, then necessarily it is a circle. And, and this should be considered as a, a kind of circular billiard is analog of Riemannian flat terms, but in, in some sense. And here is why, because this theorem, this statement one can be rephrased in the following way. Suppose you have convex C2 billiard such that all orbits are locally maximizing, I, I should say maximizing, uh, I, I shall explain why, uh, uh, then uh, it must be a circle. So this statement is exactly what we have for Riemannian geodesics. You remember, if you have Riemannian, if you have a geodesic with no conjugate points, then since there are no conjugate points, then it is locally minimizing uh, between any two points. And here is this here is the same for orbit for orbits of the billiard. So it's a discrete set of points on the boundaries. And I shall explain what does it mean uh, locally maximizing. And uh, and but but now you see that this is exactly analogous, a kind of discrete anal analog of Riemannian situation. And here is our theory of, uh, with Mironov. Uh, suppose, uh, now I need to assume that this is centrally symmetric curve. So uh, we don't know what to do in, in the general case. So suppose we have curve gamma, which is again, again C2 smooth and positive curve, which I assume everywhere. Suppose it is centrally symmetric uh, uh, and assume that there is a special invariant curve, which I call alpha, of rotation number one four, consisting of four periodic orbits. So uh, I shall explain what does it mean. And, and let, us, uh, let us think about this subset, a script which is the uh, domain between this curve alpha and the boundary of the of the face cylinder okay and then uh, the the claim is the following uh, let me show you the picture here is a here is the picture this is the face space somewhere here i have a special invariant curve of rotation number one four such that it consists of four periodic orbits. That is, you apply your map four times, you get ID. And uh, suppose that you have on this cylinder, this region, which is called a script, this region between alpha and the boundary. And I assume that only this region is foliated by a rotational invariant curve, like here on the picture, okay? So let's come back to the ellipse uh, to see that this situation is fulfilled. So for ellipse, uh, this curve, uh, these curves which lie above the separatrices, they have rotation numbers between zero here and one half here. So this means that uh, this my curve alpha for ellipse lies somewhere in between. It has rotation number one four. So for example, this one, 
and uh, all the region uh, between this alpha and the boundary is foliated by invariant curve. So now again, what theorem says that if I have such an invariant curve of rotation number one four consisting of four periodic orbits and denote the region a script, the region between this invariant curve and the boundary, and suppose that this is foliated by uh, rotational invariant curves, then gamma is necessarily ellipse. So in some sense, this is, uh, this is a kind of a step towards Birgov conjecture of, in the case of centrally symmetric curves. And uh, uh, the advantage is that the smoothness is really uh, the smallest possible, C2, uh, unlike, for example, Kaloshin, they require 59 or whatever. So, mm, okay, so now uh, this, the same, this statement, which I, uh, which I cited from this theorem, can be also uh, done in variational terms. Uh, as if uh, it uh, in in a, in a manner which uh, in the same in the same way as in theorem one, if all orbits in in this a script are locally maximizing, then gamma is an ellipse. So now I'm uh, in position to explain what what all this means. So let's come back to twist map and uh, and then it will become clear. So uh, suppose you have a twist uh, exact symplectic map of the cylinder. Uh, okay, so this uh, exact means that I, if I take a pullback uh, form, P, so let's denote PQ, the standard coordinates in the cylinder, Q is angular coordinate on the cylinder. And so I consider uh, P prime DQ prime minus PDQ, so, Q, Q P prime Q prime is the image of PQ by T. And suppose this form is exact. So DH, uh, where H is a fun, uh, it's called generating function. And so uh, let's let uh, this is the function of two variables, Q and Q prime, uh, such that uh, P prime equals uh, the derivative with respect to the second. Uh, variable and p here is the deri minus derivative with respect to first variable and so sub indices uh, stand for partial derivatives and so what is a uh, twist condition so uh, there are two twists there is positive twist negative twist so negative twist condition is when this cross derivative is positive i'm sorry about this uh, um uh, uh, uh these uh, notations but it, uh, it how it goes uh, uh, and positive twist condition means that this cross derivative is negative in this case what does it mean that uh, positive twist that this is the map which twists to the right uh, if you take your cylinder and you look at the vertical uh, direction then the image deviates to the right and uh, if it is negative twist, then to the left. And so uh, remarkably, uh, for twist for twist maps, you can write a variational principle. Uh, so in, in other words, uh, uh, you consider configurations QN uh, and you can uh, associate to this configuration a formal sum, uh, sum of this uh, H QN, QN plus one. So uh, this is like, uh, length of geodesics okay so now what is uh, what is uh, extremal of this variational principle uh, these are those configurations which uh, which give uh, extremal value to this uh, to this sum so meaning that uh, if you differentiate with respect to qn you, you see qn is uh, appears here in, and in the previous term. So you, you will have uh, exactly the equality of this uh, of this type that uh, you have an orbit of a twist map. So uh, in other words, uh, configurations uh, 
Okay, I, I, I shall explain it later a bit. Uh, so let, let's consider two examples, uh, two very important examples. First is the, it's called standard like map. This is a map which, uh, which H is written in this way. It's uh, half Q minus Q prime square plus V of Q, where V is periodic potential. Uh, in this case, if you differentiate H12 is um, uh, identically minus one. So this is positive twist. So this mapping standard like map or sometimes called Chirikov map is, is positive twist map. Uh, let's, let's us consider now gamma, our case. Gamma is C2 convex closed curve in the plane. Then birgov billiard map maps uh, this S delta to S1 delta 1, as I explained uh, before. So you have this gamma S and the angle delta. You, have, you map it to a new gamma, gamma S1 delta 1. And then here, generating function, uh, which you can easily uh, find is, uh, is this one. This is just the length of this horde. If you differentiate this, you get uh, def derivative of L1 is minus cosine delta and derivative of, of, of the, with respect to the second variable cosine uh, delta 1. So in other words, uh, you have uh, a, a, a good momenta. Uh, momenta for S is cosine delta, not, not delta, but cosine delta. And, uh, and this is also uh, if you compute uh, cross derivative, it's L12. It looks like this, and this is positive. So this is negative twist map. So now uh, we study uh, locally maximizing configurations. That is, those configurations such that uh, so those configurations QN such that any finite segment uh, is. Uh, a local maximum of truncated function. That is, as in the case in geodesics, in order to uh, make sense what is extremal, I need to uh, fix two, point, two points, say uh, uh, Qm minus one and Qn plus one, okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, points in between I allow to vary. And so I get, this function, which dep depends on those points in, in between, uh, and this is already finite sum. And so uh, I say uh, my, my, configurations is, my configuration is locally maximizing uh, uh, when uh, this function has a, a local maximum uh, uh, at the points QM. Okay, so in other words, you this is exactly as in the case of geodesics. Okay, so and correspondingly to these M configurations, correspond uh, M orbits. That is, those who uh, whose projection on on the uh, Q uh, coordinates uh, are M configurations. So here is the, this is the action functional. So we we are interested in this locally maximizing configuration. I shall explain why. So how to know that this configuration is locally maximizing? Uh, very simple. One needs to consider the second variation of this functional, or in other words, just Hessian matrix of, uh, of this FMN. It looks like this. It's a three diagonal matrix, Jacobi matrix. And uh, uh, here entries are uh, as follows. So these are uh, AN. These are diagonal terms. These are uh, derivatives uh, H22 plus H11, like this. And uh, di uh, off diagonal terms are uh, cross derivatives. So these off diagonal terms, they are positive numbers always. Okay, so now what is discrete Jacobi field? Jacobi field, uh, discrete Jacobi field, suppose you have a configuration uh, QN, uh, extremal configuration QN, then uh, the sequence uh, satisfying 
uh, this, this equation is called Jacobi field. This is discrete Jacobi equation. So you see these B, A, and B, they are, they are elements of this matrix. And uh, this is second order difference equation, okay? Like it was in the case of geodesics. Okay, now what's important, uh, so I, I will not prove it, but here is the proof, it's very short. Uh, the matrix, uh, if you have this, uh, this lemma is very well known uh, for geodesics. If the matrix of second variation uh, of some finite segment uh, is negative semi-definite, then for any proper subsegment, it is strictly negative definite. So in other words, uh, uh, if you know that, uh, uh, if you know, if you have from this lemma, it follows that if you have a locally maximizing orbit configuration, then any subsegment, in fact, uh, has uh, strictly negative definite second variation. So not just semi-definite, but negative definite, okay? Uh, and this is quite simple, uh, but I, I, I don't think I need to stop here. So, uh, and let's denote for the SQL, let's denote the set MH, the set swept by all M orbits corresponding to H. So this MH, uh, by this lemma, since every segment has uh, strictly negative second variation, this implies that this is a closed invariant set of T. So in other words, uh, this lemma helps to, to, to say that MH is a closed invariant set. So uh, um, uh, it's quite rich set because uh, uh, twist map theory tells us that MH contains all rotational invariant curves as well as all the so-called Aubrey Mather sets of this map T. So, uh, so uh, I shall explain about rotational invariant curves in a minute. So this, this is very important for me uh, for this talk. So what, what is the criterion? Uh, uh, this theorem we proved with uh, students of mine, Sadikovich. Suppose you have an exact symplectic uh, twist map such that this condition, twist condition is satisfied, then uh, the orbit QNPN is an M orbit if and only if there exists a positive Jacobi field along QN. Uh, uh, let me first uh, remind you for ge uh, geodesic case. So suppose you have a geodesic and uh, in, uh, in the plane, in, in uh, two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, uh, then uh, in case you have a positive Jacobi field along this geodesic, then you can say it, it has no conjugate points. Why? By Sturm theorem. Because uh, a, 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 if you have a positive, uh, if you have, uh, Sturm theorem tells you that if you have two, uh, if you have a solution with conjugate points, that is solution which uh, which equals zero at two points, that any so then uh, any solution by Sturm, any solution have uh, necessarily has a zero between these two. This is called Sturm separation theorem or Sturm zeros theorem, and so uh, here we have the same situation. Uh, we have an orbit, and we. Uh, we prove that this orbit is an M, M orbit if and only if there exists a positive Jacobi field along this uh, along this configuration. So, how how to to understand this? Uh, so you see, any solution uh, of Jacobi equation can be lifted to a T invariant vector field. Uh, along the orbit. So you see configuration lies on the configuration space, but you can lift it to the phase space by adding this momenta. And so uh, instead of uh, Jacobi field, you get 
inver t invariant vector field. Okay, so uh, this this can uh, can be proven uh, by a method which uh, I explained due to Hopf. So probably I, I just indicate how so how to construct positive Jacobi field exactly as in Riemannian case. First, solve. No, you need to justify why it's possible to solve. So you uh, consider Jacobi field uh, xi and k with this boundary condition, and then you take a limit when k goes to plus infinity, and you get positive Jacobi field. Here is the uh, here is the picture. You take one at uh, at uh, node zero, and then somewhere for n equals k uh, boundary condition zero, and then this point you take to infinity, okay? And uh, what you need to prove in order to make this uh, method work, you, you need to show that these uh, broken lines which are drawn on this picture, uh, that they do not intersect. And this follows from kind of linear algebra, uh, uh, what what is called Stiltjes theorem. So if you have a negative definite matrix with a positive of diagonal elements, then all the elements of the inverse matrix are negative. And this, uh, this, this theorem, Stiltjes theorem, uh, gives you that these uh, broken lines, which are solution of two, uh, boundary value problem on Jacobi field here, uh, th they do not intersect, and then you consider the limit, uh, their limit, and this gives you positive uh, Jacobi field. Now, in the opposite direction, uh, probably I will not uh, explain. So, you, so this criterion indeed, uh, okay. Now, what are the corollaries? Let me show you very simple corollary. So suppose you have a rotational invariant curve on the cylinder like this, like is drawn here, like we saw for, for billiards. Uh, so if you have such an invariant curve, then uh, there is a theorem by Bergov saying that uh, such a curve is necessarily Lipschitz function. So this is a graph of a Lipschitz function. And so... Uh, and this means that this is differential almost everywhere. So thus, I, I, I can consider, suppose we have an orbit such that at the points of this orbit, it is differentiable. So, and draw the tangent, uh, tangent line. And then take this vector, and here we have invariant, uh, T invariant uh, tangent vector field such that it projects on the q-coordinate positively. So in other words, we, we, uh, we proved that on, the, on this curve, at least for those orbits which, which pass through differentiability points, they are uh, locally maximizing by the criterion because I, I constructed positive Jacobi field. And so, but but the uh, since uh, the set of locally maximizing orbits is closed, and uh, the curve is differentiable almost everywhere, this remains true for any orbit. Okay, so thus we proved that uh, rotational invariant curve is composed by a locally maximizing orbit. In fact, Erman proved that they are not only locally maximizing, but globally maximizing okay now the second corollary is the construction of remarkable function omega which we saw in uh, hope uh, case uh, this was uh, remember it was j prime over j where j was positive jacobi field and so the construction here is very much analogous so consider uh, M orbit of the point Z P0 Q0 and then we have a, a positive 
I'm sorry, we have an in T invariant uh, tangent vector field, uh, this one, delta P and delta QN, and then we can cook the function. In fact, uh, there are they are related. Uh, delta P and delta QN are related in this by these formulas. Uh, quite easy to see. And uh, we can cook a function omega, uh, which is uh, delta Pn over delta Qn. This is analogous to the formula J prime over J. Uh, how much do I have? Uh, uh, around 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So uh, this formula, and uh, this is very much analogous to J prime over J, which we saw in the case of Hopf. And now uh, this function, uh, it's quite easy to see that the, uh, the replacement uh, of Riccati equation we had for in, in the Hopf case is the following evolution formulas that omega at the next point uh, looks like this while the uh, omega at the, at the point P0, Q0 looks like this. Here, delta Q1 is this positive Jacobi field. Uh, and uh, this evolution is quite remarkable. It replaces Riccati equation, which we had there, and uh, it will be used uh, next next lecture. I'm going to use this. What is important that uh, since H12 is positive and this delta Q1 is positive, because it's positive Jacobi field, I can conclude that this omega lies between two uh, numbers. It's always between uh, minus H11, smaller than minus H11, and uh, bigger than H22 of the previous point, Q minus Q0. And in fact, these estimates were known to uh, people. So, uh, for example, Makai, Perceval, uh, they uh, treated uh, what is called converse KM theory. So you see, uh, so, 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 so they use the idea that uh, the point which generates locally maximizing orbit necessarily uh, can pass only there, only there where this H22 is smaller than minus H11. It's not always the case. So there are places on the phase space where a priori uh, maximizing locally maximizing orbit cannot pass if this is vi violated then uh, there it cannot pass so let me draw the picture so if you have uh, this vertical space you can take uh, inverse image of the vertical space of the next point and this is uh, it has slope minus H11, and uh, you can take the image of the vertical from the previous point, and this has uh, the slope H22, and omega is somewhere in between, okay, between these two. So this is the geometric uh, picture. And now, uh, and now, uh, so in remaining five minutes, I want to address the following question. You see, uh, sometimes there are, uh, so in, in practice, for example, for billiards, uh, uh, there, uh, the, the, it appears that uh, a twist map of the cylinder, or your, uh, more precisely, billiard ball map of the cylinder, can be written as a twist map with respect to two sets of symplectic coordinates, say QP and XY. And uh, with respect to each of them, it has generating functions, say H and G. And uh, a natural question arises, uh, if, it, if it's true that uh, the set of locally maximizing orbits uh, is the same, MH and MG coincide. And uh, a priori, it's not that obvious uh, why it should be. Uh, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, at least we can prove it un under a certain assumption, uh, which I will explain what it is below. Uh, but, but generally, 
uh, it remains a kind of open question if if this assumption G, which we call GA if it's necessary or maybe it, uh, maybe always satisfied uh, okay so here is the assumption suppose uh, uh, you have a twist map which can be written as a twist map in with respect to two symplectic coordinates on the cylinder uh, and uh, generating function one of them is called h and another g and the, the assumption is that these two coordinates are not far away apart what does it mean suppose uh, here this the uh, uh, these are two spaces which i uh, showed you before this one with the slope minus h11 this h22 they divide they partite the plane in uh, north part east west and south and now what is needed that at the point which is in mh script mh uh, i want ddy be in this north part and the same for a point in mg so in other words vertical directions with respect to these sets of coordinates they are quite uh, close in this case we can prove this is a theorem that uh, the classes of locally maximizing orbits and mh and mg coincide and why it's important for me because uh, i will show you that in in many cases at least two cases uh, uh, for classical Birgov billiard, there are naturally two generating functions which satisfy this condition, which I showed you, uh, which is called GA condition. And uh, in the next lecture, I will show you outer billiard, which also has two generating functions. And one can check that these uh, two also satisfy this condition which we call ga okay and here is again the question that uh, uh, we don't know in fact if this ga uh, geometric assumption is really necessary maybe it's always satisfied maybe it's re redundant this we don't know okay so proof i i omit of course but it's really simple from the criterion to get the proof it's two uh, in fact four lines but i need Pashut, to move i need to uh, to show you the second generating function and this will be the end of of my talk so uh, remember we have a billiard birgov billiard we have uh, we had this uh, birgov generating function which i called l this is this is related to coordinates s and cosine delta okay now let us look at uh, other coordinates so any line i can define by means of uh, i take a normal to this line and it has certain angle which i called phi and uh, sine distance or momentum to this line which is called p so then the space of lines this pair p phi is the is pair of symplectic coordinates in other words omega can be written in this form dp d phi and uh, and then natural question arises what is generating function with respect to uh, these coordinates and here is the answer so uh, here here we have all generating function which is called l it's the length of the chord it's first one and now the second one the standard which i call non-standard generating function so we we choose this sim, we, we take uh, symplectic form in this form in the standard form and now we take primitive of this form which is p d phi and then uh, t star lambda 2 minus lambda 2 it's uh, p1 d phi 1 the image of p phi minus p d phi and this is called s differential of s and here is the what is the question is what is s and here's the theorem it's again uh, together with Mironov uh, uh, this s can be written in the following way this is a function of two variables phi and phi one 
which equals this twice h of psi uh, sine delta, where psi is uh, sum over two of the angles phi and phi one, and delta is half difference. And h here is the support function uh, of, of the curve gamma. In other words, it's defined like this. Maximum, the projection uh, on this uh, n psi. N psi is the normal uh, in direction psi. Okay? And now this, this theorem is very simple. Why? You need, uh, you need to differentiate this function with respect to phi. Okay, and then you get these formulas, and you need to show that this is equal to p. And uh, if you differentiate with respect to phi one, you get p one. So uh, proof is elementary exercise. So I, I have no time to to do this, but here it is. Uh, you need to write your curve uh, by means of uh, envelope of uh, straight lines uh, uh, of this form, h cosine plus y sine equals h, then uh, you want to recover your curve. In order to do this, as we learn uh, in calculus, you need to differentiate with respect to psi and solve together. So these are, uh, you differentiate this, you get this, and then you, you recover your curve gamma by this formula and now you need to project gamma scalar product with cosine phi sinus phi like here and uh, p1 uh, accordingly to uh, cosine phi 1 sine phi 1 and you get this so this really elementary proof the only thing is to recover your curve but this is really classical uh, thing uh, okay, so uh, uh, references, so probably I shall stop now here um, uh, because uh, I have no time anymore. So uh, let me just summarize. We have what I showed to you that uh, uh, for Birgov billiard, there are two uh, generating functions. Two of them are natural with respect to two sets of coordinates. And now what uh, general theory, uh, which we developed together with uh, Tsudikovic, shows that, in fact, set of locally maximizing orbits uh, for both of these functions uh, coincide. So, in other words, if I want to consider locally maximizing orbit, with, uh, I can do it with the help of function S or with the help of function L, and th this, these classes are identical. So this probably for today. And uh, next time I continue from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Misha. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Uh, are there any questions? So I'm not sure if to do Zoom first or Room first. Uh, let's say <laughs> from Zoom. Are there any questions? Uh, from Zoom? Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay. Well, actually, I have several questions, but I don't want to monopolize. Uh, the first question is, you have these uh, Jacobi matrices, tri-diagonal matrices in the right. uh, sort of discretized Jacobi uh, equation. Right. Now, tri-diagonal matrices are closely related to orthogonal polynomials. Okay. They're exactly, the recursion relations for orthogonal polynomials. Okay. And there's this, you know, and there's this famous uh, theorem which says that the zeros of consecutive orthogonal polynomials intertwine. Okay. I was wondering if that was equivalent to what you mentioned as this, uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, yeah, it could be. Yeah, so I I don't know uh, exactly, but uh, it could it could be related because uh, after all, it's a uh, kind of Sturm uh, Sturm uh, uh, separation theorem or whatever. Uh, 
Yeah, it it sounds like the same as the Sturm separation yeah, theorem. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. if they're the same. Yeah, yeah, it it could be the same, right? In other terms, somehow. Okay, thanks. I, I have another question, but I will leave the opportunity to someone else to ask. Okay, thank you. Any any further questions from Zoom? Any okay? Any questions from the room? Any questions? Uh, Okay, uh, I guess I have a few questions. I'll, I will ask one and then uh, uh, let uh, John ask his next question. <laughs> <laughs> From the Zoom. Maybe just one. Uh, so, as I said, MH. Uh, yeah. So, what does it look like? Uh, all right. So, uh, so, it, uh, so, so you see, firstly, it contains all rotational invariant curves. Okay, so all the curves uh, which go around the cylinder, they are called rotational by some slang, and uh, they are they belong to this image. Okay. Second, what we can say that all those uh, orbits which are globally maximizing, not only locally. They are they uh, they somehow constitute what is called obrimeda set, say cantore, uh, counter counter set usually, counter tore, right? They also belong this M H. Uh, now also some periodic orbits which uh, which are locally maximizing, they also there. So it's a kind of. Uh, well, if you have not integrable billiard, it's, it's, it, you can say it is a closed set, contains all this stuff which I explained, but not more than that. Mm -hmm. It is a closed set. This is very important. Can it have non-empty interior or is uh, uh, non-empty non interior? Of course, it can be, for example, for, uh, for ellipse. Or, or billiard for uh, okay it, it can be because you sometimes you have a family of invariant curves it can it can happen mm -hmm. but usually you cannot say well at least i cannot say <laughs> i cannot say how it uh, how it looks like but definitely it's a very important set mm -hmm. I see. I see. okay okay thank you very much mm -hmm. uh, john would you like to ask your second question? Okay, if we're not, if we have a little little time still. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to understand: uh, is am I right in saying that the only integrable billiards are either ellipses? I mean, ellipses. That this there's is, no other shape is, that is integrable. This is the question. This is the Birgov conjecture. So this is this is not proved, but it's a no, it's not proven. Uh, what we did with Mironov, we proved this. Uh, you can say in seat in uh, centrally symmetric case. So if you would like to, uh, you see, there are many uh, variants of this conjecture. Uh, uh, so we proved this for for a bunch of invariant curves which is between one, four and zero. But uh, most, most general question would be, uh, probably you can prove something where you have just a tiny neighborhood of uh, face cylinder foliated. And to conclude from there, that this is a ellipse. This is unreachable. Okay, um, may I do part B of the same question? Okay. Uh, so, is it? I mean, the uh, geodesic motion on uh, on ellipsoid, right, is integrable. I mean, Jacobi integrated that actually. Right. Uh, is it uh, true that the uh, geodesic? I mean, the billiard motion in an ellipse can be thought of uh, as just a discretization somehow by something like a Poincaré map of the geodesic flow on an ellipsoid. In some sense, yes, in some sense, yes. But to make it precise, I don't think it's so so simple. I mean, uh, um, I think more the, uh, wait. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you have, um, uh, Moser proved that uh, in some sense, which I, I, I cannot uh, on the spot to make it precise. Uh, if you have a, a convex hypersurface and you consider billiard 
inside this hypersurface on one on one hand, and a geodesic flow on the boundary. On the other hand, uh, then uh, these uh, yeah, and suppose this is an ellipsoid, not just a hypersurface. Then uh, Moser proved that uh, these two systems they enjoy the same set of integrals. Okay, in yes. some sense, but yes. to, but dynamics uh, to to make statements about dynamics uh, usually is much harder. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, and I, I cannot on the spot to tell you how how the dynamics are related, but definitely it's known. So the point of my talk today is that uh, you see uh, there, uh, you can study ellipsoids and you can study uh, 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 integrable integrals uh, of this form and other form, and this is one uh, level of difficulty. And now what I'm trying to explain to, uh, today and uh, next time after tomorrow that uh, uh, there is a rigidity that if you assume integrability, this necessarily brings you to the class of ellipse, ellipses. And this is uh, completely, uh, so it's much more difficult than just to study el ellipsoid in this form or uh, some other form, okay? That's what, uh, that's the message. Right. Maybe I can ask one last brief question while, uh, uh, so, um, is there a, a geometric intuition for this non-standard generating function? So, yes, it's, it's... of course, of course. Uh, it's very simple, in fact. Uh, well, but unfortunately, I don't know if I can draw uh, on this, uh, uh, maybe I can, wait a second. Uh, can you see what I am drawing? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, so now this is the curve. I'm sorry for such an awful picture. So suppose you have a, wait, wait a second. Uh, suppose you have a, um, suppose you have a line entering and then going out Igor I'm, I'm afraid I, I cannot do it but uh, uh, you see next time probably I shall uh, uh, so maybe I, I, I shall say uh, by words so imagine you have a curve and you have incoming re, uh, line and outgoing then take a point this point Okay, and then draw perpendicular from this point to, to the line. Okay, you get a new point on this edge and the same on the second edge. Okay, and then uh, travel distance from uh, this point to, to the uh, incidence point and then to the next point which I explained. This sum of two distances is exactly this new generating function. So if you have periodic orbit, then summing all these things gives you the, the same action. Mm -hmm. But if your orbit is not periodic, then it's some uh, somehow other quantity and you need to, to say to enter questions about how asymptotically and, and this I don't know, in fact. So it's different uh, generating function. And uh, for periodic orbits, action must be the same. It, this we know. And this is indeed the same. But uh, all to, but uh, we are interested not only in periodic orbits. And also we are interested in questions like, is it max, maximizing or minimizing uh, from the point of view of one classical action functional and this action functional. Mm -hmm. And this, as far as I know, it's, uh, I mean, it seems to be not uh, not immediately clear. That's questions to symplectic topologists, I, I think. I see. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> For example, I, I, I really don't know if, uh, if 
probably always. So you see, you can imagine a lot of generating functions because you 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 have a cylinder. You you can foliate it vertic by vertical leaves, uh, well as you wish, right? And then for each such affiliation, you get a uh, generating function. And uh, uh, my question is, you associate uh, this variational principle to each of these functional, uh, to each of these functions. Uh, these principles, uh, each principle has minimize minimizers. Are they the same or, or, or not? So at least we, we did uh, for this criterion, geometric criterion GA, 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 and naturally for billiards, it is said it's, it's amazing. It's a uh, long calculation, but it's it gives correct answer. So so we can use it, and then we well, in fact, we only use it. It's not a theory which uh, which we are interested in. But anyway, uh, it's a good question. Probably it's always true. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And so next time on Wednesday, right? Yes. Thank you very much.